This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. From MPB Think Radio, this is Creature Comforts, the show all about your animals and the animals around you. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. Today on the show, we'll welcome Nicole Smith from the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science to talk about the upcoming Family Fun Science Day and some exciting new developments with LaFleur's Bluff Museum District. We'll also talk with fisheries biologist Dennis Rickey about invasive carp in Mississippi's waters. Join our conversation this morning with your phone call. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 Seven four six four. You can send an email to animals at mpbonline.org. And if you ever miss Creature Comforts on Thursday morning, it repeats every Saturday morning at 6. So good morning. Hope everyone is doing well this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Libby, glad to have you back. Uh, what can you tell us about your latest adventure out west? Oh, gosh. First of all, I am glad to be back. And nice sunshine. You know, Oregon is um, known for beautiful summers, and that's a lot of the reason that we go. But Christmas, it's all about the grandkids, so we go then. <laughs> but the weather's never quite as, you know, it's not so inviting. Well, it rained for pretty much every day for six weeks. Oh, wow. Kind of cold rain. We had one nice snow to sort of break up the rain, but other than that, and I'd been there enough in the winter to know that, so I was so glad to come home and see the sunshine. I have been talking with friends that live close to me and all around the state, really, about their bird feeders this year, and a lot of us have reduced numbers of our very common birds on our feeders. I think in my yard, it's due to that extended cold snap we had last February Mm. because we found several dead birds at that time, and that's kind of what I'm blaming and hearing the same from other people. But if any of our callers are having uh, a similar – just – kind of watch and see. I don't know. Cardinals, we certainly have reduced numbers. We have loved our Phoebes. For the last 15 years, we've had Phoebes winter and summer, and they've been nesting at our house. And we found two dead Phoebes last February during that cold weather and haven't seen one since. So I'm afraid that our Phoebes are gone. And hopefully we'll get some back. There were lots of babies were reared at our house, so maybe they'll come back to um, to raise their babies close to the same place. Cardinals, uh, tough to tip mice, and chickadees are all down a little bit. So anyway, I, I, I'm blaming the cold weather. Unless anybody's got a better solution for me. Uh, and you have, think, an event that you wanted to talk about? Oh, I did want to mention, and it occurs to me, though, since there's so much cold weather coming in, you probably should check their website. Delta Windbirds, though, is having a field trip, or at least had scheduled a field trip for this Saturday. The, I believe that's the 15th, right? I think so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, it, I, I wanted to go. I'm not sure I'll get back in the car this quick after having been in it for five days. But uh, they always have really good field trips, and this is at their property on Sky Lake. Oh. So it be a, a, a really good event. But check and be sure that it's still going to happen with the cold weather coming in. And every time we mention Sky Lake, I'd like to throw in a, 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 a plug for the, the boardwalk there. It's just mm-hmm. an amazing. Um, and all the hard work of maintaining that that area is the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks, where Dennis works. And they, that's a great job. Like I said, I would encourage anybody to, to go up there and, yeah. and uh, take a, a walk through the cypress uh, trees. It's very, very impressive. Uh, good morning, Dr. Major. We've got a pet email here okay. for you. Good morning. It says, um, my three-year-old my three-month-old puppy drools while riding in the car. Is this nausea, or is there a medicine that to give her before a car trip? Well, it's a great question. Uh, a lot of dogs will, even adult dogs, will drool or get upset. Maybe, maybe not upset, but actually drool when they get in the car. Certainly, uh, talk to your veterinarian about a possible uh, medication before you leave. Dramamine may work well for some dogs. Uh, 
and there's a drug called Serenia that uh, probably would, it doesn't have much side effects, but it should help with that problem. I would suggest maybe getting the puppy out just for short rides um, in the neighborhood or, you know, as you go about. And uh, maybe with a little time, this will, the puppy will outgrow this. Uh, the emailer also asks or says she has hiccups periodically. Is that normal? Pretty normal, uh, and especially in puppies, uh, just like in, in people, I guess. Uh, and they can uh, usually, it's not something that continues on and on and on, but it is sporadic and not unusual to have hiccups in a puppy. And they're probably as annoying to uh, dogs as they are to humans, I would imagine. <laughs> Maybe not quite as annoying, but yes, I understand. Anyway. Uh, we've got a caller on the line with a dog question as well. Is it Lavada calling from Natchez? Yes, it is. All right. Hey, you're on the air with us. Go ahead. Well, um, back in December, I had to go to uh, Houston. My son had surgery, and I left my dog with my sister, and she has one of my dog's puppies. He's a year old. And while I was gone, she must have got pregnant. And I want to know, is this pretty bad for the puppies? Okay, the question was, and I, I'm, how old is how old is the, the dog that, that got pregnant? Um, Benji is um, a year old. Okay. And my my dog is about two and a half years old. How old is your dog? Uh, she's about two and a half years old. She's a small dog. Okay. She's about ten and a half pounds. Right. And this is the one that got pregnant, the two and a half year old. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. You know, I talked to your veterinarian. Uh, are they about the same size? Right, they're about the same size. Yep. Yeah. But they are related, and uh, mm-hmm. chances Close are good it. that there won't be any problems, uh, especially if there was no, uh, what should I say, genetic relationship uh, in the background. But I would suspect that everything should be okay. Uh, I w- this is one of the times you definitely need to consult with your veterinarian as she gets close to delivery, okay. and I, I feel like that it should be okay. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll take her over there. Thank you. Right. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the call. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Uh, if you'd like to join our conversation with a call for Dr. Major or some of the other things we'll be talking about today, the number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one eight seven seven. 672-7464. Send an email to animals at mpbonline.org. Dr. Major, I was at the clinic Saturday getting my cat his annual checkup. Um, is this the time of year when you're kind of busy with a lot of folks coming in uh, getting that annual checkup? It is It is uh, a busy time. Uh, of course, we've all been affected by the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, from the standpoint of people uh, maybe putting off things uh, simply because not wanting to get out. However, uh, you know, after a holiday, and any time we have a holiday, it's very, very busy a few days, even a week or so after, uh, simply because of uh, either uh, things that happened during the holiday or things that got put off. But, yes, it is a fairly, fairly busy time of the year. Well, I was proud of my cat because he was very quiet in his carrier, and he he made nary a fuss the uh, whole way over there and and during the uh, the uh, uh, um, exam and then on the way home. So he he got a little was, special treat. I was impressed. Yes, he did <laughs> quite well. Remind us of what uh, what goes on in an annual checkup and why it's important to ha- to take your uh, pet to the vet at least once a year. Well, it's a great time uh, to present any problems that you might have, I always try to ask, have you seen any uh, changes, any differences? Uh, and then uh, in the exam, whether it's the technician or the veterinarian, we usually uh, would go ahead and just do a physical exam. Uh, usually that involves taking a stool sample to check for intestinal parasites. Cats are difficult to do uh, as far as taking a sample, and I would suggest if you have a cat, bring a stool sample. Uh, from the litter box uh, from your cat uh, when you bring it in. As far as uh, just general, uh, teeth are very important to check the teeth, uh, ears, eyes, and for any type of growth or lumps or bumps, whether it's a cat or a dog, that might occur. 
Uh, there are some reasons sometimes that we need to do some blood work uh, to uh, understand if there's something strange going on or some disease process. But uh, a good physical exam, listening to the heart, lungs, uh, with the stethoscope, all of these things uh, can enter into a good physical exam. This is Creature Comforts, and it's time for our first break of the hour. When we get back, we'll talk with Nicole Smith about the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science upcoming Family Fun Science Day. Dr. Major will stick around, ready to take your pet questions, so you can call with questions and comments. The phone number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 Send an email to animals at mpbonline.org. Back with more after this. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major and Libby Hartfield. If you want to join our conversation this morning with a question or comment, just call us. The number is 1-877-MPB-RING. It's 1-877-672-7464. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. With us in studio this morning from the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science is Nicole Smith. Uh, As the Special Events Coordinator, she's here to talk about the upcoming Family Fun Science Day and other happenings at the museum. So, Nicole, before we dig into the event, we were just chatting uh, when we were off air about one of the exciting new additions to that uh, part of, of town. Tell us about the new playground. Oh, well, I'm, I'm happy to tell you about the new playground. This is awesome. Uh, it's the Lafleur's Bluff uh, pl- Playground, and it's a beast. We have uh, several sections in it. It has 80 play structures in it, and of those, 73 are accessible to all, which is just kind of wonderful. Mm-hmm. It has two separate areas. One is really for the 5- uh, to 12-year-olds called the Hedra, and that's the, the very tall-looking structure. And then the one that's to the side, the Weedra, which is the first First in the world is designed for ages of 6 to 23 months. So that way, if you've got littles, you don't have to worry about them getting trampled. They've got an area that's just for them, which is kind of great. Um, remind us about uh, some of the things that the museum is doing uh, to keep people safe. Oh, my goodness. Oh, it's been a busy year or two now. I guess that's what we're going into three. Uh, it has been a busy season. So we have... Um, we have mask recommendations for everyone. We have extra germex stations throughout the door. Our staff wear a mask. We do ask that you do. It's not a requirement, but it is a strongly recommended. That's what the CDC, you know, says is a good idea, and there's lots of great science behind that. The KN95 masks are really the best for that, um, but wear the best mask you have, of course. And uh, we have... I do some training with my exhibitors when they come with us to show them like ways to engage audiences that are a little bit more at a social distance so that guests can still have a quality experience, but they have like some safety between them. So um, we're we're trying all the things that we can try. Uh, there's probably more things that we can eventually try, uh, but we're we're doing our best on that. That, that's an interesting point that you're right. The socially distance, which is the thing to do, but uh, that might... It might seem a little artificial, so it is good to, that you're giving the folks some tips to get the, the people engaged so that they can yeah. en- enjoy the experience. And I sometimes have to remind, um, you know, especially some of my new exhibitors, that a social distance is a physical distance of six feet. It, it's a, a strange term in a way. What is it to be social and apart? <laughs> Coming together apart. Uh, so it's like it's a physical distance where you engage from a distance. So it's, you know. We're learning. <laughs> uh, so Family Fun Science Day is Saturday. If you would, uh, give us some information about that. Right. So Saturday, January the 15th. That's like, did I get the date right? Mm-hmm. I'm not looking at a calendar. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be from 10 till 3. And so I have different exhibitors from across the state are coming to showcase some of their research and the work they've been doing. So we have everything from chemistry clubs from local universities. Uh, I'm kind of excited about about some of the reactions they're going to be doing. And we've got, uh, yeah, there's some oscillating reactions, and uh, there's some uh, black light work to be done with Ublick that's going to be kind of exciting. Uh, but There's a pun in there, by the way, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and we're also going to be having uh, some university um, graduate students showcasing what they've been doing, everything from uh, sawfish research, you know, down to, like, stream water fishes. So that's going to be 
something that people are going to want to see. Uh, we have the Mississippi Geographic Alliance is going to be there with the Mississippi map. And, um, so, and sometimes they like to do a, a hike on the trails that's a guided hike on the trails for like plant ID. So they're, they're going to let me know tomorrow what they're like firmed up on, but I think they're going to bring the Mississippi map. So I've got at least 12, maybe 15 exhibitors, uh, depending on some confirmations that come through later today. And it'll be fun. Crunch time concessions will be there, too. So let's say you came in the morning and your kids get really starving. Oh, you can go hit up the hot nachos at, uh, you know, at crunch time and then come back for round two in the afternoon. So it's going to be a lovely day. Uh, we talked about social distancing, but if I remember correctly, that Mississippi map is almost social distancing on its own. It's so big. Is that right? <laughs> well, this one is uh, – you may be thinking of the big National Geographic maps that they've brought. Those things are ginormous. Now, this is uh, a little smaller, about the size of this room. Okay. But uh, but still, it's uh, it's a great thing. They, they get you to take your socks off, and you can kind of walk on the map, and they'll have you walk the streamways, and you'll learn the cardinal directions and – it's it's a really great way of giving orientation uh, to kids that may struggle with it. Like I, I myself, myself has a learning disability with spatial relationships, and uh, something like this would have been really helpful to me as a child. You know, kind of learning how to do map reading. So it's it's a real it's a blessing for a lot of people. Also, I would think you know in, in these days of GPS and computer aided this and that, this is good to you know to ke- yeah. teach these kids because you're right, they, they, to get that spatial awareness is really important. One more tool in your toolbox. It's just a good thing. <laughs> so, um, what would you say is sort of the intended age range? So, with this one, we go for elementary and middle school primarily. We always talk about career day inspirations for high school, and that's that's wonderful. That's valuable. But we start early. You know, we know a little bit about who we are when we're little, and it and we learn more about that by increasing our experiences. I joke a little bit that this event is the Whitman Sampler of science <laughs> education because you're going to see different specialists from uh, – from different fields. Like when you say scientist to a child, sometimes they think of the white lab coat, you know, and, and Erlenmeyer flask, you know, something like that. But it's so much more than that. It can be laboratory work. It can be field work. It can be engineering, you know, in, you know, in a temperature controlled space where you don't let dust get on anything because the electronics you're working on. It's just science is broad and exciting and it's diverse and it's really good to see all the different ways it manifests itself. And, you know, what I like about a lot of the events at the museum, it's not just for the kids, but it's really geared towards the whole family. And through the history and and the exhibits that you've had and events that you've had, do you find that it's better to get the whole family involved and that maybe it's a, a more rich experience? You don't get new scientists without support by the people who love you and that are in your life. Your teachers are part of that. Your families are part of that. Your best friend who is all about birds is part of that. Maybe that's your gateway to becoming an ornithologist. You never know what your inspiration is going to be. Like, I've been very touched by letters I've gotten from school kids um, about their experiences. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Our friend Sue from Beaumont is on the line, so we'll welcome her into the show. Good morning, Sue. Go ahead. Thank you all, and I, I appreciate you uh, listening to me because I don't have Internet access, and so I have to ask people who, are, who, who, who have more knowledge than me, and so it may not be apropos to this subject, but I want to ask about fire ants and another question, okay? Go ahead. There, there's a blacktop road in front of my house, and there are fire ant, fire ant mounds just exactly like they're exactly maybe eight or ten feet apart along the side of the road and i wonder what one of the mounds is the same size and their space so like like they measured them off with a tape measure how, how, how do they do that and why do they do that um, social distancing with fire ants. <laughs> yes. Ah, good and it, segue. It really is. They're very social <laughs> insects, and they do distance out because they will fight. Mm-hmm. Now they're they're that's that's the in fact that's the classic way that ant mounds do is that they've got a queen in each of those mounds and they've got they're all genetically related in that mound and they know the difference if somebody strays in from another mound. 
there are some exceptions. I think the first we saw were in Texas. There are some that they call multi-mound um, colonies, and there'll be one queen for several mounds. So, the, you know, there's there are variations of things. So, But mostly you're going to have one mound for each queen, and they're going to distance themselves out. And there are usually enough resources around where they are that um, there's plenty for them all to eat, and so they, that cuts down on them fighting. Obviously, it's not good for a mound if they're in battle all the time with another mound. So did, they spread uh, themselves out on purpose. Did E.O. Wilson do some work with fire ants in particular? Or uh, E.O. Wilson, actually, he's credited with discovering fire ants, but he was a child when he did it, talking about Did he get bit? Because that's on. how you would find yeah, it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was a kid, and he happened to live in Mobile, where they came in the docks there and he early on he had started really studying fire ants already and so he said this is something new and it's i think appropriate that we talk about him a little since he contributed so much to our understanding of nature and Mm -hmm. ants in particular Mm -hmm. and since he passed away recently and he spent a lot of time in mississippi yeah i got to go to the pascagoula river with him years ago quit bragging just bragging now that's just a name drop right there but anyway (laughs) so those fire ants yeah we can we can can definitely connect him to them and sue you're right they're spaced out i guess you could go out there and do your own science experiment by um measuring and watching, seeing well, how close they true. dare get to each other. Could I ask y'all another question, too? Thank you for explaining that. Sure, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I, I watched on PBS a, a documentary about life above the Arctic Circle, and uh, it, it showed a, you wouldn't believe it, but they, there was a place up there where, where in the spring, what they would call a spring, things thought, I don't know, where the, there were some grass that would turn green and the trees would leaf out. And I wonder, how do these trees survive how do trees survive month after month of sub-freezing temperatures, I mean frozen solid, and then thaw out and grow, and put out new leaves in the spring? Uh, are, are, do trees have some kind of uh, antifreeze that allows them to, the sap, not to freeze? Uh, the trees are frozen solid after months and months of sub-zero temperatures. How, how, do they, how do they live? I mean, do they have some kind of antifreeze in their sap that yes. allows them to thaw out and live again? Yes, that's exactly, and that's a good term for it. It's an antifreeze. But it's a chemical in their bodies, and, and different species are able to produce that. And some trees don't have it, and you're not going to find them in a cold place, and some do. And um, animals produce something very similar, some do. So particularly smaller invertebrates have um, a lot of capacity to to um, endure cold, extreme cold. And it's such a great adaptation. You know, like, I I think it's good to kind of keep in mind that what thrives and survives in an area is there because it was resistant and able to survive in that area. So that genetic material got carried down to, like, the next generation. So if it wasn't tough enough to make it wherever it is... um, that's all she wrote for that one. But the ones that did well, they kind of keep on. So each one is going to have its individual adaptation that makes it thrive in those environments. All right, Dasu, good to hear from you. Thanks for the call. And it reminds me of uh, the adaptability of nature is amazing because we're here by the Pearl River. The I pass over it every day on my way to work. <clears throat> and there's a big swath of land that when the Pearl River rises is completely underwater. And then when it's not, it's not, obviously. And there are trees there. And it was always fascinating to me the same thing how the tree can survive basically being underwater for large portions of the time during the year Uh, but again uh, nature is uh, adaptable and is one of the fascinating things about it Uh, we've got another friend of the uh, of the show on the line it's uh, kathleen from osaka good morning kathleen good chilly morning (laughs) (laughs) and we finally got a winner and i'm going oh no listen (laughs) I got a tip for people who, like myself, are on a budget. If you have these fire ant pile, uh, piles and you want to get rid of them, I found a 50 50 solution of vinegar and water takes them out just as quick as uh, the poisons, and it's more environmentally friendly and doesn't last very long in the soil. So uh, that's my tip for the day. I hope uh, somebody out there might be using that because uh, if they're like me, I try to stay away from all chemicals. You know, just just a, ASAP, get them out of here, you know. But y'all have a good day, and I'm enjoying your show. All Thanks, right. Kathleen. Thanks, yeah, Kathleen. That's a, yeah. 
You know, I sh- probably shouldn't share this, but my thing is when I'm mowing the lawn, I can never resist mowing over the, lawn, the mound, which I've been told is probably not a good idea because I'm probably throwing fire ants all over the lawn. But I don't know. There's something about that little bit of revenge. If you've ever been stung by a fire ant, it's very painful. So uh, it's cruel of me, but I sometimes, like I say, try to get my revenge. I call so. that Godzilla complex. <laughs> <laughs> That's your Tokyo. You're taking it out. <laughs> We need to take a break, but uh, Nicole, if you would, remind us of the particulars of the uh, Family Fun Science, let me say that, Family Fun Science Day. Now, you got to say it five times fast. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be this Saturday, January 15th from 10 till 3. It comes with museum admission, or if you are already a member of the museum, then it's free to you, so it's all good. <laughs> all right. It is time for another break. Uh, if you want more information about the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science, you can go to MDWS. FP.com slash museum. When we get back, we'll be talking with Dennis Rickey, fisheries biologist with the MW, MDWFP, about the invasive carp that can be found in Mississippi's waters. Also, Dr. Major still on hand, ready for your pet questions. So give us a call to join the conversation. The number is 1 877 MPB Ring. It's 1 877 672 7464. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. Kevin Farrell here on Creature Comforts with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. We're going to welcome next our next guest, Dennis Rickey, from the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. Today we're going to be talking about in the uh, invasive carps in, carp in Mississippi waters. Dr. Major, still ready to take some pet questions. Got some open phone lines, so if you want to join the conversation, the number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 You can email animals at mpbonline.org. Uh, good morning, Dennis, and thanks for joining us. If you would, uh, tell us a little about uh, your background. So my background is... Um I got uh, two degrees in biology, in in fishery biology, and I worked in Kansas as a district fisheries biologist in Louisiana, and then I came here, and I did a research project at Enid Reservoir for the state, and from that time on, just various projects in terms of farm pond information, commercial fishing, um, invasive species, environmental coordination, um, that type of thing. You know, earlier we were talking about kind of um, um, inspiring young people to go into uh, this line of work. And what sort of inspired you to, to do what you do? Um, well, it was, it was really two things. I was active in the Boy Scouts, and I like to be in the woods. And so we would go camping once a month, and I like to fish. And when I got in high school, um, I discovered that uh, I like biology. So when I was thinking about what to do, I said, well, perhaps a good thing to do would be to combine all these things. <laughs> and so let's, let's study fishery biology. And, that, and that's how it happened. And I never regretted it and never thought about changing professions. So you've been on the show before. We talked about the invasive giant Salvinia, but today we're here to talk about carp. Uh, but first, how is it these invasive plants and animals are introduced to our ecosystem? And I imagine it might be a variety of ways. It is a variety of ways, and it mainly involves um, humans, um, whether through accidental or intentional. Um, intentional could be uh, you dump something out of your aquarium. You can't it got too big for your aquarium. You can't bring yourself to put it in the trash or put it in the freezer, and you want to give it a good home. And also, in some religions, there's a ceremonial release of animals. Um, and it could be accidental from a flooding of a fish farm, uh, an escapement, uh, some kind of way, uh, a levee breaks, a hurricane event, you know, that that type of thing. Um Coming in on ships, uh, you know, fire ants came in from South America on uh, probably packing cargo, uh, that type of thing, um, an insect in, in lumber shipments. Um, so it's, it's various ways like that. With, with these species, okay, the invasive uh, carp species, and there are about four of them, um, one was used for weed control, uh, grass carp. And we still recommend that, except that we want them to be triploid or sterile. 
Okay, they don't seem to be causing too much trouble. Um, the other two, silver carp and big head carp, and also black carp, uh, were used in by state and federal agencies to clean up water quality. At least. Uh, silver and big head carp. We were doing research on them. I don't think any was done in Mississippi, but the EPA and some other states did them, and and, and fish farmers used them too. Um, and the black carp was to eat uh, a mussel uh, or snail in a pond that was uh, the intermediate host for a catfish disease. So um, they got there in various ways. The first one in the wild was discovered before fish farmers had them. So it had to come from a state or federal agency. Um, <clears throat> are we changing the way we deal with introducing new uh, things into the ecosystem that we've learned that because, as you said, all, all those things sound like admirable things to do and, 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 and positive. But is there a little bit of a different approach to now that what might possibly be happening down the road? There is a different approach now. There's a piece of federal legislation that was passed in 1990. Uh, after um, um, zebra mussels got into the Great Lakes and they were released from ship ballast water um, that ships carry. Uh, And um, so it established regional aquatic nuisance species panels. And that led to the development of state management plans. So now there's about 43 states, and Mississippi is one of them, that has a state management plan for aquatic nuisance species. And that allows us to get a little bit of federal money to do research, to buy aquatic, approved aquatic herbicides, to treat invasive plants, um, to have harvest programs, things like that. So we're more enlightened about the, the dangers and the risk of having invasive species on the aquatic side than, than we used to be. And so <clears throat> you mentioned that there are four kind <clears> – <throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, is any one more prevalent in Mississippi than the others? That's a good question. Initially, um, let's say from the, the, the 90s and, and mid-90s and early 2000s, we saw big head carp. And it looks like a big minnow, and it's got a mottled appearance on the side. Uh, that's what we saw initially. And then um, – we started seeing more and more silver carp, and it, it looks like big head carp, but um, it's, it, it has a silver appearance on the side. And the reason for that is, uh, is interesting, and silver carps are the ones that jump. Big heads don't usually jump. They get aggravated by boat engine noise, and you see those videos of them, all these fish jumping out of the water. Um, silver carp, both these species are filter feeders, like shad and paddlefish and all young fish, when they're when they're small and young, they filter feed. Okay, they they're feeding on phytoplankton and zooplankton. Well, it, it turns out that the gill rakers, the um, and the gill filaments that capture the organisms when the fish filter feeds in the silver carp, they can feed on a smaller size of phytoplankton and zooplankton than big head carp. So we have competition between those two species going on and the silver carp are out competing them because they have a greater range of food that they can eat. And is uh, are these invasive carp found in all parts of Mississippi's waters? Right now they're found in, of course, the Mississippi River, in the Mississippi River drainage, and just about everything that connects in that. And in Mississippi that would be principally the Yazoo River Basin. We have some isolated reports of them in the Pearl and in some of the, the coastal rivers. Uh, but the And also they're starting to come down the Tennessee Tom Bigby Waterway from the Tennessee Cumberland River system through Pickwick, down the canal to uh, Bay Springs and perhaps a little bit downstream or south of Bay Springs. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio, visiting today with Dennis Rickey from the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks, talking about the invasive carp that are in uh, in Mississippi waters. If you have a question about that or a question for Dr. Major for your, about your pet, give us a call. The number is 1-877-MPB-RING. It's 1-877-672-7464. 
7464 email animals at mpbonline.org so why are the carp such a problem for boaters and anglers well it's due to the um the jumping ability or the uh from the silver carp um you know um they get big they can reach 80 or 100 pounds and so you know you you're you're boating or you're skiing uh, and uh, you're traveling uh, in a boat, and all of a sudden um, you've got fish jumping around, and they may jump in the boat. They may hit you. Uh, the same thing with jet skiers. Um, think of something, you know, 20 to 80 pounds jumping out of the water and, and can hit you. So that's that's the main danger uh, to boaters. Yeah, I could imagine if you're, if you're skiing uh- – <laughs> And all of a sudden, an 80-pound fish jumps out because you're going fast, obviously. The boat's pulling you on. So that does seem definitely like a problem. Yeah, and I just have to, by testimonial, <laughs> I was knocked down and injured slightly. We we recreate a lot on the Mississippi River and camping and fishing and bird watching. And we started having a, a big problem several years ago with them jumping in the boat with us. And like I say, I was knocked down. I mean, completely down. You hit the, the ground with... Uh, carp. So we resolved never to let it one go. If it jumps in our boat, it's not going back in the river. <laughs> and we started experimenting with various ways to eat them, and we found good ways to take them home and utilize them for food. But um, yeah, that, it's they're pretty. I, I had a friend that was the one jumped right in her face, and that was wow. there was a good bit of damage from that. They're they're bad guys. You know, this is kind of funny. When I was a kid, we lived in Florida, so we would ski the bayous. And I had this unnatural fear of, like, creatures when I was skiing, you know, coming up from under me or whatever. And now when I hear this story, it's like, maybe I don't want to go back skiing again. Um, So, Dennis, did did you mention what causes them to jump? They get stirred up by noise, uh, like boating noises and things? Is that what gets them riled up? That is what gets them riled up. And there's research going on to... To find the frequency of sounds that um, um, agitate them as possibly a means of uh, deterrence. So they're doing research on bubbles, the use of bubbles, light, sound, electricity, carbon dioxide. The thinking is at, at a confined location like a lock and dam, if you can install these types of barriers so that when the when the, the the barge tow comes through, you know, you turn on your barriers and you'll let the barge come through with the towboat, but you'll block the invasive species, the carps, from coming down with the, uh, with the barge and the tow. Uh, let's get a question in, a call in before our next break, and it is uh, Mark who's called in from uh, Pickwick Lake, Tennessee. Good morning, Mark. You're on the air with us. Go ahead. Appreciate taking my call. Um, how predominant are these carp at Pickwick Lake? Are there any barriers at Pickwick Locks or Wilson or Wheeler Locks on the other end of the lake? I'll hang up and listen. Okay, right now we think that um, it's the beginning of the invasion at, at Pickwick. There was a research study done um and it was in Yellow Creek Arm of Pickwick. It just concluded they didn't catch any fish at Pickwick, and they caught just three fish at uh, Bay Springs. Um, you asked about barriers. Uh, Mississippi participated in an interagency effort with the TVA and the Corps of Engineers to um, do a structured decision-making process on all the the TVA dams and the Tennessee Cumberland system, including Wheeler and Wilson, Pickwick, uh, all the way up to Watts Bar. And um, basically we picked uh, or prioritized some locations where we thought that uh, barriers could be effective. And um, Pickwick was one of them because it's the gateway down the Tentom into the Mobile and, and Tom Bibby River Basin systems. But Funding is lacking right now, but hopefully with a Water Resources Development Act bill, perhaps some funding, that will be forthcoming in the next couple of years. 
You're listening to Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Time for our last break of the hour. If you have any creature questions, don't hesitate to call. Also, Dr. Major is still on hand, ready for your pet questions. So to join the conversation, the number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one eight seven seven six seven two. 7464. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. We'll wrap things up after this last break. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guest is Dennis Rickey from the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. Still time to join the conversation with a question or comment. The number is 1 877 MPB Ring. It's 1 877 Six seven two seven four six four. You can email the show. Send it to animals at mpbonline dot org. Dennis wanted to ask you about some initiatives to uh, help the problem that the DF uh, the department is working on. But we do have one call to get to, and it's Jerry in Madison. Good morning, Jerry. You're on the air. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. I was wanted to ask Dennis if he could speak towards the issues with the non native snakehead, and also a comparison and how you can tell the difference and the native of both end. And I'll, I'll listen to y'all his answer. Okay, the, the non-native snakehead um, was in Arkansas, and they tried to eradicate it. They thought they had eradicated or killed all of them, um, but they found it in an adjacent river basin. And so the last couple of years, we've had probably 10 occurrences in Mississippi I'm not that concerned about it because it doesn't seem to be competing or displacing um, um, our native fishes. It looks very similar to a a bowfin or a grinnell or shoe pick if you're from Louisiana. But the the, um, snakehead has a very long fin on the bottom of the fish near the tail. It's called the anal fin, whereas the bowfin has a shorter fin. And the, the coloration on the side is more mottled, and the head shape is a little bit different. So I'm not really concerned about the bow fin. All right, Jerry, thanks for that call. <clears throat> so, Dennis, so tell us about what uh, MDWFP, what initiatives they're doing to help with the problem of these invasive carp. So we have, we've got a little bit of money from the State Aquatic Nuisance Species Plan, and our biologists have tracked um, – silver carp and big head carp in a Tennessee Tom Bigby waterway and we do that by putting out uh, listening receivers and implanting uh, tags in the fish where they give off a, a signal when they they're giving off the signals all the time and the receivers pick it up so we've been doing that for about six years and uploading the data to a regional database uh, recently Congress has appropriated more money and specifically for Asian carp, and first in the Tennessee Tom Bibby, I mean, in the Tennessee Cumberland Water Basin, and then um, in the Mississippi River Basin. So we have um, six research projects going on right now. A lot of them are being done by students and professors at Mississippi State University, and they include uh, uh, another tracking study at Tennessee, I mean at Pickwick and and um, Bay Springs was just concluded. Um, we have a data app in preparation for to input the data uh, in a standardized way. We have a, a tracking and movement study at Moon Lake in northwest Mississippi. Another one will be starting at Eagle Lake. The difference between the two is Eagle Lake has some water control structures, the muddy bayou control structure and the steel bayou control structure. So we want to see how those water control structures influence movement in and out of the lake. <clears throat> There's another one called an oxbow typology study. Now, what that means is typology means characteristics of oxbows. So there's oxbow lakes, which are, are, are natural lakes resulting from the cutoff of the the path of a river, okay, and the lake gets cut off. Think of Eagle Lake. Um, it's a teardrop shape, sort of, uh, horizontally. And so they're all along the Mississippi River. So or can we identify characteristics that make some of those oxbow lakes more prone to invasion um, from um, uh, these invasive carp? Um, those are the research things. Now, and if you ask, well, what are you, being, what are you doing to control these species? Um, 
we have started with federal funding and some matching state funding. We have started to have an incentive program or a reimbursement program. If uh, you and there's two um, processing plants in the state, one is operational. It's an old catfish processing plant in Baird or Sunflower, Indianola, right around there. Um, so if they buy uh, these invasive carp from the Mississippi River Basin and the Yazoo River Basin and pay at least 25 cents a pound to the fishermen, we will reimburse the processing plant 18 cents a pound. So that started about a year ago in September, and so far, slow start, but so far we have reimbursed for 80,500 pounds of invasive carp. The majority of that, like we talked about before, is silver carp, about 74,000 pounds, and about 5,000 pounds of big head carp and 1,600 pounds of, of grass carp. Is there any way we're going to get rid of these fish? Totally No. They're too widespread. They're too abundant. But we can do something by having uh, harvest to limit their numbers. And the next step is, that's the first thing, is to get the harvest, uh, to get the fishermen to bring the fish to you. And the people that buy the fish, the processing plants, they have to have a market to sell those fish. Currently, the markets are in um, New York and overseas in Asia, but it's a limited market. If we could, and development has been started on this, make products like Libby said to um, that you could go buy in the store, in the Kroger, or go to the restaurant, or feed in school programs and prisons, you know, using invasive species for something people could consume, that would be great. Yeah, I think I think that's got a lot of promises that uh, the culinary experts out there will take it and make it something that people will be clamoring for. And who knows, maybe there'll be a shortage uh, sometime in the near future. You never can tell. Only got about 30 seconds left. I'd like to remind you about the Family Fun Science Day taking place Saturday, uh, uh, January 15th from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science in Jackson. Um, so, Dennis, appreciate your, your coming in there. And it, uh, it it's... And interesting, but it looks like at least uh, we're headed in the right direction about trying to to, to get a, a handle on controlling the fish. I think we are. We're starting. Creature Comforts is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio, funding provided in part by listeners. To hear today's show or previous show, you can go to mpbonline.org slash Creature Comforts. Our show is produced by Java Chapman, and our call screener today was Liz Gill. So for Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guests, Dennis Rickey and Nicole Smith, I'm Kevin Farrell. Stay tuned because up next, it's autocorrect. We'll be back next Thursday at 9 for another Creature Comforts, heard only on MPB Think Radio.